Well, good evening, and let me welcome you as you come to join with us tonight for our Bible study and prayer meeting. It's great to see you, and we do appreciate you making the effort to come out, and we trust that God will bless us. And for those listening in on Facebook at home or wherever you might be, well, we welcome you as well. Thankful that you've joined with us tonight too, and we pray that you will be blessed and helped and encouraged as we come to the Word of God. Now, I'll keep the announcements very short, but just a reminder of Sunday, where we meet in the church at 11.30 and 6.30 p.m. Prayer from 10 to 11 through to 20 past 11. That gives the people time to get back in again to the, uh, the meeting in the morning. I'll be preaching. Philip Bowles will be the singer at our evening meeting, and we encourage you to join with us, especially Sunday night again. Last Sunday night was a great start, and it was lovely to be back again, having sat in the house, I suppose, from March times. It was great to be back, great to have fellowship, great to sit under the preaching of God's Word and to listen to the glorious gospel of God's grace. So we hope that these nights will continue, the numbers will keep up, and do please join us on Sunday night. Now, let's do it a little bit different tonight. Let's read, first of all, in the book of James, let God speak to our hearts through his word, and then we'll speak to him in the attitude of prayer. So turn, please, with me to James chapter 1, and reading from verse 1 through to verse 12. James 1, verse 1 through to verse 12. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof faileth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Let's take a moment quietly, let's together our thoughts and to come into the presence of God and to pray for his blessing upon us, upon others who need our prayers, and upon his word that we have just read together. So let's earnestly seek God's blessing upon each one of us. Our God and Father, in the quietness of these moments, we draw near to you at the throne of grace in worship, in praise and in adoration, for the psalmist reminds us that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We come, our Father, to you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour, and how we thank you for him, the one whom our soul loves, how we thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ ever left the glory of heaven to come into this world of sin, to die on an old rugged cross, there to pay the debt 
that we owed and yet could never pay, and there to shed his own precious blood in order that our sins, though they were many, might all be forgiven. We thank you tonight we can each one say from experience that the Son of God loved me, and he gave himself for me. Father, we want to thank you then for the place called Calvary, where the Lord Jesus Christ took our place and died our death and bore the very punishment that was our due, that we might go free, that we might have the knowledge of sins forgiven, that we might become part of the family of God, and that we might be sure within these hearts of ours that heaven one day will be our home. We can say with one of old, I know him, I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love revealed in him. Thank you for your precious word of truth that we have just read together just now. Father, we take great delight in coming to the word of the living God just now. For so often in the past you have ministered to us in dark times. You have encouraged us when the soul fainted within us. You have directed us when we have sought your mind and will in changing situations. And Father, your word certainly has been a lamp unto our feet and a light onto our path. So we come to it afresh tonight, hungering to hear the voice of God speaking to us, longing that we might know the help of God the Holy Spirit. For Father, we need to hear your voice, not the voice of man. We need to understand these verses and therefore, we pray tonight for the Spirit's help, and we pray, Lord, that great blessing will be brought to our souls as we fellowship around the Word of God. Bless everyone bowed before you just now in this building. Bless others who are not able to be here but are listening in on the live stream on Facebook. We commend them to you as well. We ask, Lord, that even in their own home that they too will experience the blessing of God. We remember those who'd love to be here, but they cannot. Some are laid aside just now, and we'll be praying for them later on tonight. And we just want to commend them, each one, to you and to your gracious care. Father, we pray that you would overrule concerning them. We pray that you'll give doctors and nurses all the help and guidance that they need as they seek Father, to minister into the hearts of your people. And especially in these days, our Father, during this pandemic, when there's so much pressure on the health service, and in particular doctors and nurses at this time, we pray for them, our Father, that you would give them the strength, the grace that they need, that you would protect them from this virus. And we pray, Father, that you'll watch over them too, because they're doing a tremendous job, and we just commend them to your care. So hear our prayers as we come just now into your presence. Where we have failed you, forgive us, we pray. Cleanse these hearts of ours afresh from all our sin and help us to be in that place where God can pour out his blessing upon us tonight. And all these things we ask, giving thanks as always, in the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, you may remember that the last time we had been in the epistle of James, we were considering how to pray in the midst of our trials. Remember how James said to these believers of old, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, you and I know from our own experience of life that prayer 
is a great blessing in the Christian's life, although we have to confess at times that it's not always something that is easy to maintain. And certainly we know that it's often more difficult to pray when we find ourselves in the midst of our trials, because that's the time you and I can very easily lose heart and we can lose hope. We feel that God doesn't care about us, and if he did, then we wouldn't find ourselves in the circumstances that we're facing at that particular time. We feel that God's not listening, that heaven is silent, and we have to go through these trials alone, but that is not true. God cares about each one of us far more than we could ever imagine. God hears every prayer that ascends to the throne of grace. God knows everything we're passing through, and God says to us, you don't have to go through this alone, for I am with you, and I will never leave you. Now, these people, knowing that they were going through trials in their faith, James sought to encourage them, and he sought to teach them how to pray in the midst of their trials. And firstly, we noted the need for prayer in the midst of our trials. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Let him ask means that he not only assumes, but he accepts that prayer is a very important part in the trials that we face in life. In other words, these trials that come to us at various times in life and come in different ways, these trials should drive us to God and get us down on our knees in prayer. They should show to him our own hopelessness, the fact that our own resources will never, ever be enough, and they should remind God and us of how much we need our help. Because God can not only hear our prayers, but give us the resources that we need, not just to cope with trials, but also to live above them. And when we don't understand what's happening to us, always remember this. We must trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We must not lean on our own understanding. We must acknowledge him, allow him to direct our paths, and therefore we must not waste our times of suffering because there are always lessons to be learned. Secondly, we noted the need for faith in our prayers. James says, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. You see, beloved, James says to us here, pray in faith. We must be sure of the desire of God to give us what we're asking for. We must believe in the power of Almighty God to deliver in answer to our prayers. And we must come with sincerity of heart, without any doubts whatsoever. There is no point in me or you praying that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything we could ask or even dare to think if we don't believe it. God wants us to come with a sincere heart to have a deep trust in his ability. And if we don't have faith when we pray, our hearts will be gripped with unbelief. We'll not enjoy the blessings God has in store for us. We pray without faith or real conviction, then our prayers will lack both prayer and purpose. Now tonight, come back with me here to James chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 9 through to 12 in particular. And what we're considering tonight is simple, but it's very important. How to express joy, whatever our circumstances. You say to me tonight, but pastor, that's impossible. When you're down as far as you can get down in life and discouragement is like a cloud hanging over you, it is not possible for me or for you to be joyful. Well, listen to what James says here. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, 
he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, remember that in his opening comments of this little epistle, James has already expressed the fact that he was writing to those who were enduring great trials of their faith. In other words, they were experiencing difficult days. And James says to them, listen, it's possible, even in bad, difficult times, it's possible in the midst of our trials to actually have joy in the midst of them. And James of Christ has already said that, for remember what he said to them. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, that would seem to suggest to us that joy is to be the normal experience for every Christian in every circumstance of life and even in the midst of our trials. Do you say to me, but pastor, that's not an easy thing to achieve, and I agree with you. But James says it is possible Despite all that we're facing, despite what we're going through, despite the trials that are weighing heavy upon our hearts, James says that it is possible for us to have an inner joy. When the dark clouds gather, sometimes we're overwhelmed by circumstances. Swimming against the tide makes us feel at times we're going under And when we feel like that, and we feel that life has treated us harshly, it's very difficult to rejoice in anything. But here's what James says, and as we look at this tonight, James goes on to identify three different situations that any one of us can face in life. And he explains to us the nature of this, and he also reminds us it's possible to be joyful even under great duress. Let's see what he says. Let's understand what these verses mean. Note firstly here what it is to cope with poverty. Listen to what James says, verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now remember that these believers had been scattered abroad. And they were in a very difficult place because they had been displaced. They left their homes. They're living in a strange place. And these people, like so many who find themselves displaced, they're not only poor, but they're deprived of the very basics of life itself in order to survive. Many years ago, whatever I labored with the Slavic Gospel Association. I remember going into uh, Serbia just after the Kosovo War. I remember going into a center that provided food for refugees who had come from all arts and parts of Serbia down to the city of Nice. And the pastor of the church, I was doing meetings for him at that time, but throughout the day, we were able to meet some of these people and talk to them because they were from all arts and parts of Serbia. Some of them had lost loved ones on the way who had died. They didn't make it. And others were just coming in from sitting at the side of the road, living in a park, and they were coming in to get some food. I met one man. His name was Milko Rolovic. And he was helping us. And I only discovered after that that he actually was a brother of the pastor down in the church in Nish. So I got the interpreter over and I asked him to tell me his story. Now, I'm not going into the details of that tonight because part of it is horrific. And since we're going out live, I am not going to say some of those things. But he told me his story. And then I said to him, where are you staying? He said, I'm staying down in a wee room at the back of the church. So he did this and he waved at me and I went with him along with the young interpreter. And there he took me into this little room. Now, there's a room, ladies, that you could hardly keep stuff in just to wash around the house. Just a little cupboard. And he showed me two buckets. He says, one of those is to wash in and the other is for me to use as a toilet. 
He said, I've lost everything. I've lost my home. It was burnt. I've lost my animals. They were killed. And he said, this is all I have. But he said, you know what? I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And the thing about that is this, that that man wasn't even a Christian. He had lost almost everything, including his mother, on the way down, and he said, I'm thankful. You see, beloved, all across our world tonight, because of one thing or another, perhaps it's to do with the control of government, perhaps it's the way they treat their people, perhaps it's as a result of war or something else. All across our world this evening, there are people who are displaced. There are people who are actually living from day to day. And some of them are the most thankful people that you and I could ever meet, and they've got nothing. Now, for these people, James is writing to, their situation was tough. It was perplexing, and James wanted to encourage them. In fact, he seeks to remind them that having come to faith in Jesus Christ, Christianity had not only changed them, and it had not only impacted their lives in so many different ways, but it brought to those in poverty a sense of true worth. He says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. The Amplified Version translates it like this. Let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation. What does that mean? Well, you see, the words used here, the brother of low degree, could literally be translated as one who does not rise above the ground. James is referring here to a brother in Christ who finds himself in very humble circumstances, and James tells him to rejoice, because he may have nothing of this world's goods, but in the Lord Jesus Christ and through faith in him, the gospel has lifted him to an exalted position, and he has in the Lord Jesus Christ everything that he has need of, and he ought to take great pride in that. That's what James is saying to this man in his poverty. He may be poor, but he matters to God. Beloved, remember that all of God's children matter to God. Sometimes they may not matter to us by the way we treat them and the attitude we show toward them, but all of God's children matter to him. He matters to Christ, this man, because Christ had redeemed him with precious blood. He matters to his brothers and sisters in the church because there are no distinctions within the family of God. We are all one in Jesus Christ. Be very careful sometimes that as Christians we don't become like the Pharisee who, remember, in the temple looked up at God. In fact, he didn't look. He gave him a glance, and then he told God how wonderful he was. And then he turned around, and he looked at the poor man, the publican, and he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like this man. Why? Because he was the dregs of society. But Jesus said that that man who beat in his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner, was justified in the sight of God, not the publican. Be careful when we look down at others who don't have what we have, who don't go where we go, who don't live where we live. Be careful. There are many of God's people tonight, better Christians than I will ever be. And many of them are living in poverty. And James says to this man, look, you matter to God, you matter to Christ, you matter to the church. Now, in any other realm but the spiritual realm, that just wouldn't make any sense. Remember, these people were far away from home. They'd left their land. They're going through trials. If they had a job, they probably 
were the lowest paid workers in society. So therefore they were vulnerable and they were being oppressed. And James says to them, look, take pride in your position. Because you have all the spiritual treasures in Jesus Christ that you will ever need. You're rich beyond words. You see, beloved, being in Christ changes everything. They may have been in a bad place materially. They were in a blessed place spiritually. They were poor in the eyes of the world. They were rich in the sight of God. And James is saying to this man, look, look beyond all the limited blessings that you have. Look to all the riches, those spiritual riches that you have in Jesus Christ. And take pride in your position because you belong to him. Didn't Paul the Apostle say of his own life, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content? There were times when Paul had nothing. There were times when he despaired even of his very existence but whatever his state, he was content because he knew he had all things in Christ, all things at his disposal. And he said, but my God shall provide all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And what Paul says, what James says here, in the world in which we live would be very, very strange statements. You see, so many people feel tonight that their whole existence and their happiness in life depends on material blessings. So many people feel if they had everything they needed in life, they'd be happy and they'd be joyful. That is not necessarily true. There are many rich people in our world just now and there's no contentment, and there's no satisfaction, and there's no joy. And even though they can buy all that their heart desires, those things, things in themselves bring no happiness nor satisfaction. That's understandable, isn't it? Because didn't the Lord Jesus Christ say on one occasion to his disciples, a man's life, does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. James says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. He might have to live in poverty. He may have very little of material things. But as a Christian, spiritually, he's eternally rich. He may have to live a life that is for him just above the bread line, but spiritually he has all things in Christ richly to enjoy. Do you know, beloved, isn't it strange but true that as far as the Christian is concerned, our conversion to Jesus Christ is a rags to riches story. By that I mean this, in our sin, you and I were paupers, clothed in the filthy rags of our own self-righteousness. Now in Christ, we're rich toward God. We're clothed in perfect robes of Christ's righteousness, and we have everything in Jesus Christ that we will ever need. Hallelujah to that. That's a wonderful place to be. James says the brother of low degree can rejoice that he is exalted. What it is to cope with poverty. Secondly, what it is to cope with plenty. Listen to what James says in verse 10 and 11. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now, what a contrast this is. James now turns to another man, and this man is at the other end of the spectrum. His circumstances are completely different from the poor man because 
James is talking here about a Christian who is rich, someone who seems to have everything going for him. And James says that he needs to understand that riches are temporary and that they need to be handled in the right way. You see, the danger with riches is this. They can give us a false sense of security. As long as we have plenty at our disposal, we can use our money to buy anything we want. Because of our abundant resources, we feel that we have need of nothing. And sometimes for many people, that includes God. James says, the rich man ought to remember one day his circumstances could change. His riches could be gone. Trials could come. He could lose everything. And because of that, he would have to depend solely on the grace and on the goodness of God. Beloved, when trials come, money cannot always solve them. So James says that even the rich man, though he has plenty, just like the poor man who's living in poverty, this rich man needs to throw himself upon God and realize that his faith must not be in his riches, but his faith must be in God alone. Now, we need to underline the fact tonight there's nothing wrong with being rich. And if you're saying, Pastor, you're saying that because that's you. That's not why I'm saying it. I'm saying it because it's true. There is nothing wrong with being rich. God's Word does not condemn riches, but what it does regarding riches can be looked at in a twofold way. Firstly, it warns us of the dangers that riches can bring because we read the love of money is the root of all evil. And secondly, it teaches us that we should use our riches carefully because ultimately, at the end of the day, what we have belongs to God. And we are only stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And it seems to me here that James is more concerned about the rich man than he is about his riches. And just as conversion gives the poor man a whole new perspective, and despite his poverty, he's rich in Christ, so too the rich man should have a new perspective in that, because all he has is all of God. And he is nothing more than a sinner. Ah, oh, yes, he may have a good standing in society. He may have everything that money can buy. He might live a different life from those who have nothing. But at the end of the day, all that he has belongs to God. James goes on to remind us of that fact later in verse 17 when he says that God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. So as far as the rich man is concerned, his wealth does not change his position because like the poor man, he's in Christ and they both owe Christ everything. And if any man's not able to grasp that, and if he's depending on his wealth instead of depending on Christ, James makes this point by way of illustration. And what a point this is. He says, but the rich... In that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And we must remember, of course, that as far as James is concerned, he has the Mediterranean climate in his mind. He takes an example of a wild flower. In the morning, it looks beautiful. There's a little shower of rain, and the shoots sprout, and the plant will prosper. 
And then with the heat of the rising sun on one hand and the wind that is coming in off the desert on the other hand, it's not too long until that lovely little flower disappears. It just dies. And then finally it's destroyed. James says, interestingly here, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I wonder had James in his mind the words of the prophet Isaiah, who says this in Isaiah 46 and 7, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. So what does James mean? Well, what he means is this, if a man or a woman, for that matter, depends solely on what they own. They're holding on to something that is temporary. And circumstances can very easily and quickly change. If a man lives his life depending on his money, he lives by earthly values, it has no lasting or eternal value. Why is that? Well, because life is so uncertain, a good bank balance can be very vulnerable. Earthly things are transitory, and a disaster could be waiting around the corner that could leave you with nothing. And that's why James says, look, put your faith in that which is eternal. Trust God and trust God alone. Put your effort into those things that we cannot lose. Or as Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I read just recently of an old lady who was quite eccentric, and she left 10 million pounds to her cat. Now, she found the cat one day outside the house. It was a stray, and she took it in. She looked after it because she had no family of her own. She left everything that she owned to her cat. Now, what a waste of life. What a waste of her resources. You might say tonight, well, Pastor, I could cope with that if I had it. Well, my father used to say it takes a steady hand to carry a full cup. And James says it takes a spiritual person to cope with riches and to use them in the right way and to use them for eternity. We see what it is to cope with poverty. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. We see what it is to cope with plenty, but the rich in that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Thirdly, very quickly, what it is to cope with pressure. Listen to what James says, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. James finishes this little section with what you and I would call a beatitude. You know about the beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and how they begin with this word, blessed. It's the same Greek word. It can also be translated by the word happy. And it would seem that James is taking us back here to verses 2 and 3. Do you remember how he spoke about the trials of life? These believers under great pressure, he wanted to encourage them. But I also think he has in mind both those who were coping with poverty and those coping with plenty. I love the way one commentator puts it when he says this. The poor Christian and the rich Christian are both under pressure. One is tempted to doubt God because he has so little and the other is tempted to desert God because he has so much. What a quote that is. So James has a word of encouragement for both of them. 
and a word of encouragement for all who were under trials of faith. He says it, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We know that there are a number of crowns referred to in the Scriptures. That's for another time. We don't need to go into that tonight. This crown of life that James refers to may refer to the fullness of life that God grants to those who trust him, who persevere in the midst of trials. The Lord has promised it to those who love him. James is not saying we're saved by enduring trials. He's saying the believer who endures his trials will be rewarded. In fact, the words endures temptation involves more than just passing through trials. The word suggests that there is an idea here of remaining steadfast to the end. And remaining steadfast to the end produces the patience in our lives that James speaks about earlier in verses 3 and 4. So let me sum this all up. opening section, that God wants to strengthen us in the midst of our trials, that God wants to strengthen our faith in Him. God wants to develop our character as Christians, and God wants to assure us in the midst of them, not just of His presence, but of the sufficiency of His grace. And after all, God the midst of a trial tonight. Remain steadfast. Trust in your God. Draw from His strength. Your affliction will lead to blessedness, and you and I will be able to experience joy even when it seems that all hope is gone. All of our struggles and trials in life are fitting us for glory. Do you ever think about that? All of our trials in life are fitting us for glory. So remember that the next time you are being tried and you have a cross to bear, it'll only be for a period, and one day you will exchange it for a crown. As far as James is concerned, we see how we can express if we love God, then we can trust Him in every single circumstance. And not only can we cope we can overcome them, and we can experience joy. Joy. Let's take a moment quietly. Let's pray and just ask God to help each of us as we close. Father, as we take a moment just quietly again, as we come to the end of this time around your word, we thank you for the lessons that we can learn. And we do pray tonight, our Father, that whether it's poverty, plenty, or the pressures of life, we pray that we might learn to trust you. We know that you want what is best for us, but sometimes we have to go through trials in order that we might be changed, in order there might be a greater conformity to Christ in order that our faith might be deepened and developed. So we pray that in the midst of our trials, you would help us, and you would strengthen us, and you would give us all the grace that we need. And in the midst of these difficult times, we pray that we might know what it is to experience a deep-seated 
joy in our souls. Father, that's not an easy thing for us to achieve, but we pray that we might strive for it and learn lessons from our trials in life. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.